dressed in his righteousness alone. For his stand before the throne. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nathan Hunter. I'm the worship pastor here. Welcome to worshiping with us today. I'm so glad that you are here. You're going to have opportunity a little bit later to sign up for small groups. And uh, that's going to happen at the end of the service. You're going to be able to hear from all of the small group leaders in what they're going to study, when they're going to study, and uh, what time, what day they're going to start on. And so I encourage you, today is the best day out of the entire year to get involved in, in growing in your relationship with God and one another. And the Bible has a lot to say about one another. It says in John 13, 34 through 35, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Romans 10 also says, 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 be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourself. How can we love one another? How can we be devoted to one another and honor one another if we're not with one another? Do you catch that? So we need to be together. We need to be with one another. And it's kind of hard to do that 
only on Sundays. You can do that, some of those things on Sunday, uh, but we need to continue to do more and more of that to be able to be with one another, and we can do that in small groups. So I encourage you at the end of the service in the cafe, there's going to be tables there with the leaders uh, there to tell you anything about their study they would like that you need to and sign up for one of those groups. There's going to be a group that will fit more towards your age group, from children to youth to adults to senior adults. So please sign up for that. At the end of the service as well, uh, there's going to be a lunch. So if you um, don't have anything prepared today, please go and enjoy the lunch at the end of the service today. Again, glad that you're here. Great opportunity on this on this kickoff week and this kickoff Sunday to get involved in small groups. Let's all stand together as we worship Jesus today. Glad that you're here. Jesus. 
the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the seated. Well, good morning and welcome to Now Then Alliance. If I haven't had the privilege of meeting you before, my name is Nate Kemper. I'm the lead pastor here and love that we gather each week to celebrate who Jesus is together. As a church, we exist to equip people to find life and faith in Christ, and we believe we do that best as we connect with each other, as we grow in our own relationship with God and encourage others to do the same, and as we participate in what God is doing in our lives and in the world around us. And like Pastor Nathan said in the video that began this morning, you'll have a number of opportunities to hear from our small group leaders and some of our ministry leaders about what some of those connecting opportunities are like in ongoing relationship with other people. But there is opportunity always for some kind of connection on Sunday morning. One of the ways that you can do that is filling out the connection card so we know how to best keep you up to date. But maybe more importantly on the back side of that, you can let us know how we can connect with you uh, through prayer and the things that maybe you want to see God do in your life or the things that you want to celebrate that God has recently done in your life. We'd love to join you in praying for that. We do that as a staff every Monday morning and then many from our church family join in those prayers throughout the week as well. We'd love to have opportunity to do that. Another great way to connect will be around uh, 1215 or so this afternoon. We'll have a meal in the cafe. It's free. We'd love for you to show up, connect with other people, explore some of those other opportunities for ongoing connection as well. Just celebrate this season and time together. There's great opportunity for that. I want to make you aware of a couple of other things that are coming up. Some of these are listed for you in the bulletin. Some of them aren't. They're just uh, things that are opportunities coming up. On October 1st, we have a connection event here at the, fir- uh, uh, at the church. That's for anybody that wants to come. Maybe you think that a small group sounds intimidating. You're just like, I'll just try an evening. If you'll give me some dessert and guide me through a process with some people around a table with me, that's an entry point for me. We'll have that available October 1st first at six o'clock. It'll be a time where there'll be some guided teaching. So I'll do a little bit of teaching on uh, some of the Old Testament law and how we interpret it. I know that sounds thrilling and exciting, but trust me, if you come, you'll probably learn something about the Old Testament you didn't know. And you'll learn that in a group. It'll be some guided teaching and then some practical discussion about those things in the tables that you're at together. Hopefully tables of about eight people. So if you come as a, a married couple, then you might be with a few other married couples. If you come as a single, you'll be with some other people as well. We'd love for you to come uh, that night and join us us that night for that. It's also the night that volleyball starts. So if you want to connect with people through active exercise and playing volleyball, that'll be that night after that event as well. And then want to remind you uh, of our women's retreat. They extended the deadline for signups. That women's retreat is September 24th to 26th. That's just a few weeks away, two weekends away from now. But if you're still interested in that, you can go to our district's website, NCDCMA, North Central District of the Christian Missionary Alliance. Dot org and find out more about signing up for that as well. And then lastly, news that we've been waiting for for a super long time. When's the building going to get done? Pastor Nate, what, what's holding things up? Everything has held it up at some point. Different materials, different labor, different negotiations with insurance companies. But the final piece of things we were waiting for was the held up HVAC units. Our air conditioner units that were on back order are supposed to arrive in the middle of October and the roof and HVACs then are supposed to be put on the week of October 18th through 21st or 22nd, that Monday through Thursday or Friday. Shouldn't affect our Sunday morning schedules. May have a little bit of effect on some of the ministries that week. You'll hear more from the leaders of those ministries about that. And then the week following the October 24th-ish week is when they should start finishing up all of the internal buildings with our hope that by the end of October, everything is done 
That's the hope. We're excited about that. You may still need to work with us on some adjustments that will take place during the end of October as that work uh, goes into effect as well. Many of us, as an act of worship, choose to give back to God some of what he's blessed us with. If you're new here, if you're visiting here, we don't want you to feel any pressure or obligation to give. Though if you'd like to join us in worshiping God in this way, you can do so physically in the offering box that's placed in the lobby. If you're engaging with us digitally or prefer to give digitally, you can do that through our website, nowthenalliance.org. There's a give tab there that can walk you through all of those instructions. Regardless of if or how you would choose to give, we want to pray for how God would receive these gifts and how they would be used for his kingdom. Would you join me in that prayer? God, we're thankful for what you've done in our lives, and most importantly, the gift of life you've extended to us through Christ. And yet we recognize you've given many other things to us. And so as we take time now to give some of those back to you, we pray it would be pleasing and acceptable to you as an act of worship, and that you would use these gifts to spread your love and to grow your kingdom in a world that could desperately use more of it. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together again. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Bring the presence of the risen Lord to renew my heart and make me whole. Cause your word to come alive in me. Give me faith for what I cannot see. Give me passion, your purity, Holy Spirit. into works of grace, breath of God, show Christ in all I do. Holy Spirit, from creation's birth, giving life to all that God has made. Show again on earth cause your church to hunger for your ways let the fragrance of our prayers arise lead us on the road of sacrifice that in unity the base will be clear for all the world to see. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. 
What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone, who took on flesh of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross says Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. In the death of Christ I live There in the ground His body lay Light of the world by darkness slain. Take it up now. Then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. With the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ. In me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man. Sing it out. Till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Amen. You may be seated. I enjoy worshiping with you all. I enjoy the way that we get to sing and celebrate who God is together. I enjoy that some of us may hear Nathan's instructions on how we do that very differently. For instance, some of you hear Nathan say, take it up. And that to you musically means something. You're like, hey, he's going to change keys. We're going to go a little higher. And so that means that's what I'll do. I'm tone deaf generally and don't have any musical talent. So when I hear Nathan say, take it up, all I hear is sing louder. Take the volume up. Take your enthusiasm up. And I'm thankful that each of us can interpret that whichever way our skill sets allow as we worship together. If you have a Bible and are going to want to follow along today, we'll be primarily in Acts chapter 11. Uh, we've been in a series for a few weeks now talking about what it looks like for us to be in the right rhythms as a body of believers. We started that series looking at what it looks like for us to do the one another's that scripture talks about together. How do we encourage one another and love one another, uh, bear one another's burdens. We've uh, looked then after that at things like what it looks like to be iron sharpening iron and coming alongside each other. And then we've begun doing a case study of some of the churches in scripture. 
Last week we looked at the Church of Jerusalem and, and what it was effective at, particularly how it cared for itself, its inward discipleship and growth in those things, and then learned from some of its flaws, that it didn't necessarily do the fullness of the mission God had asked it to do. It wasn't as good at the outreach and evangelism towards Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth that God had tasked it with, and, and asked questions about ourselves and our own church in light of that. Uh, Today we'll be doing the same, looking not at the church of Jerusalem, but the church in Antioch. We'll get to that in a moment. But as we've been in this series, it's actually been a year-long series talking about our rhythms. What our rhythms look like with God. What do our rhythms look like with our families? What do our rhythms look like with the church? We'll end up at the end of the year talking about what our rhythms look like as we impact the world that surrounds us. And I just want to remind us that that if that's not something you've been evaluating in your life, if you haven't started new rhythms, if you haven't made any changes, that now's still as good of a time as any. Maybe actually a better time of the year for most of us than any other time of the year. It often feels like the slate of a new calendar is a great season to start new things, and it is. I typically make new goals around that time. But for many of us, as the fall season starts, as summer ends and different habits of life begin again, ministries at churches kick off, schools start, sporting events change, schedules of life are often new and different. It's a great season and time of life to evaluate your rhythms, and if they're the rhythms you think God has designed you for, or if they're just the rhythms you've happened into. And I want to encourage you to think through what God may be saying about your life rhythms and put them into practice in the way that's best for your growth in relationship with him and with his people. The church in Jerusalem, as we studied last week, a kind of the founding church that exploded on the scene on the day of Pentecost and continued to grow faithfully, gives us the idyllic picture of what it looks like to study the apostles' teaching, to pray, to meet with each other, to share possessions, to to meet needs together. Uh, It gives this picture of church. And then as we discussed near the end of last week, it takes a couple of years, but eventually that church becomes persecuted. Riots break out, and in the fear for their own lives, that church is scattered around the world. That's what starts their uh, meeting the mission that God had sent them to, to not just be in Jerusalem, but to reach out to the people of Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. As that church scatters, it starts to spread other places and new churches begin to form. And some of that clearest uh, development starts to take place in the book of Acts in chapter 11. We're going to look first at verse 19. It says this. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. The church in Jerusalem has scattered, and as it's scattered, it knows it's supposed to take the gospel everywhere it goes, the good news of who Jesus is uh, and who Christ is everywhere it goes. And so as they begin to spread because of persecution, it says they, they go all over. We're going to look particularly at Antioch, and it says as they go, even into places like Antioch, they begin spreading the word only among Jews. When we read that, it, it might sound strange because we know the ending history of the story is that the Gentiles will end up hearing of the good news. In fact, most of us know that we likely wouldn't be sitting here if the Gentiles hadn't heard the good news. We, most of us, our ancestry will fall in the Gentile line far more than the Jewish line. And yet it made sense to the Jerusalem church as it spread to start primarily with the Jewish people. And by make sense, I mean, this is what they had seen and known. Jesus's primary interactions were with the Jewish people. Their church formed primarily out of Jewish people. Jewish people from all over the world who had come in for the day of Pentecost, but Jewish people. They had understood the message of the good news of Christ being a fulfillment of what many of the Jews had been anticipating in a coming savior and Messiah. And so there was an easy starting point for that conversation. And so as they go to new areas, they use the methods they've seen to the kinds of people they've seen those methods be effective, and they continue to share the message that they have given their lives to. Yet somewhere, at some point, somebody in the church and some leaders in the church had to start asking some questions. And maybe one of the most clear questions they had to ask was, 
Why are we only sharing this message with the Jews? If we believe in the value of what Christ has done for all people, and we know it's the best possible news there is in the world, why would we limit who we're sharing it to? Why would we stop it at just an ancestry or lineage or cultural demographic or geographic demographic? Why wouldn't we want this news to go everywhere? While the church in Jerusalem didn't really ask that question, as the church is forming in Antioch, it begins to ask that question. We've got a valuable message. Shouldn't we do everything we can to get it to everyone it can impact and not just settle for the people that it's been effective to before? Verse 20 gives us just that specific instruction. It says, some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Syene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. In Antioch, this church shifts. It shifts from primarily being groups of Jewish people who have heard the good news of the gospel of Christ and given their life to him as Savior to anyone hearing about the gospel of Christ. And giving their life to him. And suddenly there's different demographics in the church. There's people who are Jewish who have come to understand Christ as Savior. And there's people who are Greek who have come to understand Christ as Savior. They don't have a, a religious Jewish faith background at all. And yet they come and form this one body of believers together from entirely different kinds of backgrounds. Like I said just a few moments ago, most of us are thankful for that. Because most of us are now included in the good news of Christ being shared with us. But it brought some questions. Particularly, the Jerusalem church had some questions. Are the new methods okay? What, what do we require of these people who don't have our Jewish faith? Do they have to... Do they have to adopt all of the Old Testament customs and laws and rituals that we've known our whole lives? Is that part of the Christian faith or separate from the Christian faith? What does it mean to follow Christ and what, what parts of your life have to align with that? And as this church in Antioch is springing up and it's sending the message to people we haven't really sent that message to before, is God involved in that? Or is this just a bunch of people changing the systems and methods of church, trying something different and getting too far from the original look and intent? And as the Jerusalem church is hearing and catching wind of what's taking place there, they decide it's time for an investigation. We need to figure out if what's happening is something God is a part of, or if this is just some people off doing their own thing and their own methods. It's an offshoot that needs to be squelched. So verse 22 says, news of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. They sent Barnabas to go see if what's taking place is doing God's work, or if it's a group of people doing church wrong. Doing it under different methods, towards different outcomes, with different groups of people. And they want to know what's taking place. Let's send an investigation to figure out how that church that's doing it differently than we're doing it. If they're okay or if they're not okay. And this is what happens when Barnabas shows up. When he arrived and saw that the, what the grace of God had done, he was glad. And he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Barnabas shows up and says, this is all good news. People are giving their lives to the Lord. The grace of God is doing amazing things in these Greek and Jewish people in Antioch. They're, they're seeing new people come and being brought to the Lord day, and so he encourages them. It's actually what his name means. Likely wasn't his given name. The encourager is sent to Antioch, sees what God is doing, and encourages them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He saw that it was from God, and that it needed to be cultivated, it needed to continue, it needed to grow, it needed to be poured into. And so he, Barnabas, didn't simply hear that 
encourage them, go back to Jerusalem and say, no, they're all good. Let's check that box and move on doing what we do while they do what they do. He says, no, no, the act of God is taking place here. The grace of God is at work here. The message of Christ is being spread, not just to Jews, but to anybody who's willing to listen. And Barnabas wants that to grow. And so instead of just going back to Jerusalem, he decides it's time to put the right leaders in place of the church. And he wonders what it would look like for the faith of the people of Antioch to grow, their depth of knowledge in the Lord to grow, the truth of Christ in their midst to be more clear and more powerful. And he starts to remember the story of a man who has helped in some other places with that before. This is what it says in verse 25. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Saul is a name that's showed up in the book of Acts before. It's a name that as you maybe are familiar with scripture, you recognize is also then used as the name Paul and is the apostle who writes most of the New Testament letters to the churches, arguably the greatest evangelist in all of history. And yet when Barnabas was going to look for him, Saul had been discounted by most of the church. He's introduced to us a few chapters earlier in the book of Acts as as a terrorist to the Christians, persecuting them, terrorizing them, seeking their demise. And so when he has a life-changing encounter with Christ, gives his life to Christ and begins to learn the good news of Christ to be shared to the earth, you can imagine the hesitancy for many Christians to believe in his salvation as real. The person who has killed them is trying to infiltrate them as a leader they are hesitant to see that happen. Between Acts chapter 9, when we're kind of introduced to Saul in that way, and Acts chapter 11, I just want to clarify some of the historical context and timeline, because we read the book of Acts as if it's one continuous story, and it is, but it's a continuous story over roughly 30 years. And the introduction from Saul in chapter 9 to Barnabas going to seek him out in chapter 11 is likely about a 10-year gap. For 10 years, Paul has been kind of discounted by the church in Jerusalem. He's been sent away, not encouraged into leadership, not considered an evangelist or an apostle or one who should be over the discipleship of many other people. But when Barnabas sees what's going on in Antioch, he says, this people, these people need a teacher and a leader, an effective person to share the good news of Christ with them. And Barnabas has belief in someone that other people had discounted. And so he goes searching for the right person to cultivate the movement of God in Antioch. And he's convinced it's Saul, who we also know as Paul. And he goes and finds him. and He brings him and gives him opportunity that nobody else had given him. He finds a leader to pour into and give opportunity that many had discounted and pushed away. And for a year, Barnabas and Saul continue to meet with the church in Antioch and to de teach great numbers of people. And then it says there, the end of that verse, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. A movement has formed. It's spread out of Jerusalem from the people that were there at the day of Pentecost and those they've reached out to, to this, this growing group of people from every kind of backgrounds. And as it's taking place in Antioch, there, people are starting to notice. You'd go to the marketplace and the conversations just aren't about what happened at the local Colosseum gladiator style events. They weren't just about what football team is winning. Yes, I get that's chronologically inaccurate and they weren't playing football. But football starts today in the NFL and so some of you may be thinking about those things. The, the conversations weren't about what social media things or TV or plays were taking place in front of them. The conversation started to be about Hey, have you heard about this resurrection thing? And this group of people that believe that there's life after death. 
Have you heard about how we could have a relationship with God through this Jesus Christ who's come to the world? Have you heard about these people talking about the kingdom of God being here now, not just something that comes in the afterlife, and that there's only one God, not a pantheon of gods? What do you think about that? And the conversations they're having at markets, at spas, in communal baths, in the courtyards, start to become about these good news conversations. And as people are trying to think, well, well, who are the people that believe that and what is that called? Like anything in history, they want to start to label what that looks like. How can we reference the group of people talking about this Jesus figure, this Christ, this Messiah? Are they all Jews? Well, some of them, but not all of them. Are there Greeks there? Yeah, but not everybody that's there is Greek. Do they, do they all believe in the Old Testament Moses covenant law? Well, some talk about that and believe in that, but not everybody. Oh, so they're all citizens of Antioch? No, not that either. There's people coming from everywhere. But are they all identified with Christ? Yeah. Then, then let's just call them little Christs. That's what Christians meant. Just like Christ. What a, what a wonderful thing for a church to be known for, right? The one thing we know about those people is that they're identified with Jesus Christ. They might not all be Jews. They might not all be Greeks. They might not all follow the same laws in the same ways. They might not all be from the same areas. But every one of them identifies themselves with Jesus. The name sticks. The branding goes well. It's still used today for us. And yet, the title as it's stuck hasn't necessarily always stuck with the same meaning. Many in our culture now, when they hear Christians, they don't think, oh, those are people who identify with Christ and they're like Jesus. Many think about politics or policies, or programs, or personalities, or whatever. How wonderful it would be if today, in our church and in the church globally, what we were known for was our identification with Jesus Christ. If anybody who was having conversation about believers... Christians identified us first and foremost with our connection with Jesus and nothing else. Not the laws we do or don't follow, not the locations we are or aren't from, not the demographic we do or don't belong to, not the voting block we are or aren't, not the personalities that are or aren't on TV, just simply identifying us as people who long to be like Christ and share his good news. Our hope would be, my hope would be, that that would be our identity. Identity is given to the church in Antioch for the church around the world. How great it would be if we returned to that same identity. It's not all Antioch cats. They don't just get identity. Uh, they get mission as well. They understand that their task as a church isn't just to stay in words, to take care of the needs in their own community, to help themselves and to grow individually, but that their, their hope is to connect and grow with every believer around. I'll paraphrase the next bunch of verses, but Acts chapter 11, 27 through 30, as it's still talking about Antioch, essentially says some prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch, and we're going around to the church around the world, and we're talking about how they had prophesied that there was a famine coming, and that if, as the severe famine would spread around the Roman world, that, that there would be impact for the people of those settings. And the church in Antioch is better prepared for that than the church of Jerusalem. Antioch is the third most successful and largest Roman city at the time. It has more resource and more help from the culture that surrounds it than other cities. And so they're convinced that the most of them will be well off. But a church like Jerusalem and a place like Jerusalem has been 
discounted by much of the Roman world. It isn't the PowerPoints or highlight of the things that they do, and so the famine would likely hit them harder. And so the church in Antioch says, if this famine's going to come, we have to do something about it to help the church that's in a less fortunate spot than us. And so they do what churches have done throughout all of history. They gather resources. They take an offering. And they say, if you only have little that you can give, give little. But if you're blessed and have much that you can give, give much. And it says each people, all the people in the church of Antioch were giving according to what they were able to give. And they took this collective offering and they handed it to Barnabas and Paul and said, take this as our elders to Jerusalem to help the church there in preparation for the famine that's coming. They had mission not just for their own needs, but for the needs of the people around them and figured out what it looked like to sacrifice on behalf of mission. They got identity. They got mission, a mission to help and spread the good news of Christ, to help other believers and to spread the good news of Christ. And then they got the thing that's less fortunate, They got conflict. Churches doing new things with new methods often get that at a higher rate than other churches, though every church will end up with conflict. I said that last week. There's not a perfect church anywhere in the New Testament. The churches in Scripture all end up with lots of conflict and lots of things we can learn from as that takes place. But that that may be highlighted even more so when a church is stemming away from some of the methods the church has always known before and trying new things and reaching new people. When you have that kind of leadership taking place, it's likely that conflict shows up. The church of Antioch ends up with three significant conflicts. First conflict that they end up with, or maybe the biggest conflict they end up with. I don't know that it's not actually chronologically first. The biggest conflict they end up with. Does everybody have to follow Moses' law? Has stemming hinge points over things, particularly like circumcision. Do all the Greeks who are giving their lives to Jesus need to be circumcised to be Christians? Or is that something only covenantly related to the Old Testament Moses law for the Jewish people. The conflict breaks out. They disagree. They call councils about this. They have meetings in Jerusalem with the disciples and apostles to try to resolve this kind of conflict. They do resolve it. They have healthy conversation, come to healthy conclusion, spread the result of that conflict out to the world, the churches around the world, which see it resoundingly as good news when it comes. But it marks the Church of Antioch for a time. They have interpersonal conflict. Barnabas and Saul, the leaders of the church, have conflict with each other. They're eventually, after the year of teaching in Antioch, they're sent out to go start churches around the rest of uh, the Greek and Roman world as well. And they have a conflict over who should be on that missions team. Is it just Paul and Barnabas that get to go or does John Mark get to come with them? And they disagree about that. Ultimately to a point where they will stop working together because of that conflict. And they'll work through that conflict eventually, and Paul will end up celebrating what John Mark does, even though he had refused to want to work with John Mark for a season. But there's conflict that shows up. And the third is kind of a conflict of judgment. Paul particularly starts to get frustrated with people he sees behaving hypocritically. Other leaders in the church he sees behaving hypocritically, behaving one way in front of the Jews and a different way in front of the Greeks. And so he calls that out and addresses it. He says, this looks like hypocrisy to me and this can't stand. And so there becomes this interpersonal conflict, particularly between Paul and Peter, about what it looks like to be the people of Christ in a world of Jews and Gentiles and how to reach them. In, in our denomination, we have a, a, a branch from our national office that helps churches with conflicts. It's called the Alliance Peacemaking uh, Cohort. And they give advice to elder teams and pastors on what it looks like to be peacemakers in the midst of conflict. And so they've got a saying that's, 
technically true, but always hard to believe is true when you read it and are in the middle of conflict. They say, every conflict is an opportunity for good. That's the coaching they give. Every conflict is an opportunity for good. And most of us would probably read that, hear that, understand that, and say, yeah, there's truth in that. The conflict that's led through in a healthy way can always end up being an opportunity for good. And yet for many of us, our default response to conflict isn't to say, oh, great, it's here and this is an opportunity for good. We often fall into one of other two kinds of reactions to conflict. Maybe you'll identify with one of these. Conflict for many of us is an opportunity for avoidance. How we put on a good face of talking about everything but the conflict. How we make sure to not ruffle any feathers. How we try our best to distance ourselves from the discomfort that tension can bring. And so we create within us patterns of belief, conversation, and habits that are all about keeping things comfortable and easy, but never about addressing the conflict. On the flip side of that, we see people who are gung-ho to walk into the tension, but not as an opportunity for good, simply as an opportunity to win. It's not that conflict is an opportunity to find good. It's that conflict is an opportunity to win. Most of us, because of our flesh nature, when conflict arises, find ourselves either trying to run from it or to win conflicts. Instead of finding the healthy patterns through conflict for good. The outcomes for the Church of Antioch in all three of those settings end up being healthy and good. That doesn't mean every step they took was necessarily the right, accurate, godly given step, but they, they work through conflict well together. We have it recorded in scripture for us. I encourage you to read about it in Acts 12, Acts 15, Galatians 2, or we will find a number of those stories. But as we hear the story of the church in Antioch, it, it asks some questions for us. Questions based uh, for our church or for us individually as believers for, uh, from the church in Antioch. Do we have our identity as a body of Christ and little Christs? Or has our identity become something else? When you think of your engagement with people of this church and your, uh, the people you align with, connect with, do life alongside is the primary thing that unites you and that you want to be identified for who Jesus is? Or has it become other things? Have you picked those you connect with because they're helping you be more like Christ or because you just have other boxes you all check together? Have we lost our mission? Are we doing what God asks of us, not just for ourselves, but for others? Are we willing to help all of those who are in need with any abundance that we may have? Are we willing to sacrifice on behalf of others? Are we willing to share the good news with anyone who will listen? even if it requires a different method or a different style than may have been what was used to save us or to reach us? Have we lost our mission? Maybe one of the harder ones. Can we handle conflict in a healthy manner? Can we handle conflict in a healthy manner? Can we see tension and conflict as opportunity for good? And not just as something to avoid or something to win. Can we handle conflict in a healthy manner? In asking some of those questions, I, I mentioned last week that a number of these thoughts are inspired by uh, this book, A Stained Beauty, by our denomination's president, John Stumbo. As he's writing about the Church of Antioch, he gives some some thoughts for, for our churches, talking about the kinds of leaders we, we sometimes gravitate toward, the kinds of people that sometimes feel like they ruffle feathers in churches because they're trying to change things and explore new options for reaching people. Here's some thoughts he gives. He says, this calls for a sincere soul reflection, which may not be easy. Hence, I ask, does our church push away the entrepreneurs? What would need to change so that their input is welcome? Do we tend to play it safe when someone is calling us to change? Let's admit it. Some of us are more committed to our method than our message, and this must not be. 
The life-changing gospel of Christ is unchanging. However, the methods in which it is delivered have changed and must change. Not understanding this, many Christians choose an era of history with which they are comfortable, a style of music that suits their taste, and a manner of doing church that was effective decades ago and has become entrenched, stuck, cemented, entombed. We may feel righteous, but are we truly being effective? As we consider this point, let's not point fingers at others. Instead, let's ask the Lord to reveal any area where we are more committed to a certain methodology than is wise. If we are unwilling to surrender our favorite methods for the advancing of our eternal message, we need to repent. May our temporal tastes never eclipse our persistent passion for our church to have eternal impact. The hope is, as a body of believers, we would be identified as little Christs, doing our best to follow Christ with a mission that says we want to help everyone understand the good news of Christ. And if that means the method needs to change from what we knew at the Church of Jerusalem or from what we've known at the Church of Acts or Antioch or from what we'll see at the Church at Corinth or Galatia or Philippi or Ephesus or, or any number of other New Testament churches, what we would recognize is the method often changes. It has throughout history. It did in uh, the New Testament. It has since and it should the message never changes and it shouldn't i don't read that uh, and use those words to create any sense of panic or fear we're not getting ready to make any large change that i'm aware of at our church we're not getting ready to uh, change music styles even though he addressed music styles we're not getting ready to change methods in a large way that i know of but to to remind ourselves of the reality of what the community around us needs. In that same chapter, he, he asks a few questions. They're, they're rhetorical questions, but I want to ask them to us anyway. There's an implied answer maybe that we'll all agree on in these questions. First question, do you believe there's any less need for gospel in our communities than there was a decade ago, 50 years ago when this church came onto this land, or 70 years ago when this church came onto this land, over 100 years ago when this church started, is the need for the gospel any less in this community? Is the power of the gospel any less for saving and changing lives? Has humanity become so fabulous that it's lost the need for our message of Christ's love? Does every person in our region have a loving community that provides friendship, hope, and support? As I think we would all agree that the gospel is still needed in our communities, that the gospel still has power for saving and changing lives, that the message of Christ's love, humanity still desperately needs to hear, and that the people that surround us need loving community that provides friendship, hope, hope, friendship, hope, and support. We would all recognize churches are still needed. Believers need to still gather together to become like Christ. And churches are still necessary. And the other fact is that for many of us, we don't necessarily have the friendship, hope, and support that we want either. That's why we talk often about how connections with other believers is so valuable for so many of us. Where a culture might say that you primarily can get that through your family, the brokenness of our family shows that many aren't getting it there. And that the most significant way we get it will be with people who are aligning us towards Christ. It's valuable for us. That's why today we want to spend opportunity and time giving people that, that connect with others through ministries and small groups, letting you know about what that can look like in your life so that you can find a place where the gospel is present, where we recognize the need for Christ's love, and there's a loving community that can provide friendship, hope, and support. I'm going to pray and kind of close the preaching time. And then as I do, a number of our ministry and small group leaders are going to uh, come join me and present a little bit about opportunities you have to connect in, uh, with other believers, to be little Christ together, to do the mission 
together, to work through conflict together. Would you join me that we would be those people? Join me in prayer, God. We're thankful. We're thankful that your word to us doesn't gloss over the fact that no church is perfect, that methods change, that conflict arises, that tensions happen, and yet that your goodness to us shows that as we would work through those in a healthy way, as we would connect with others and do this together, that we would find life and faith, that we would find growth, that your church would impact the world. And we pray that our church would be that, that it would be a church that as it connects with each other, as we present the good news to the world around us, that there would be impact in this community. It would be a church that sacrifices, that we'd be a church that identifies as people of Christ, that is on mission to help uh, other believers sacrificially to spread the good news to all who are willing to hear it, and that we would handle conflict in a healthy manner. Help us in the midst of that to understand where it is that we can find friendship, hope, and support as we do so. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, come on up, other small group leaders. And uh, Jim and Donna Bremer aren't able to be here today, but they're leading a small group, and they, and they introduce it this way. Are you tired of the status quo Christian life? Do you long for a spiritual breakthrough? Are you looking to go to the next level to get a, a fresh infusion of faith and spiritual passion? Great Christians live out their faith with purpose. You'll explore the idea that there are certain practices available to every believer at every maturity level to move us from good to great in God's eyes. And they'll be leading that in Elk River on Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. starting next Sunday the 19th. The study will be Good to Great in God's Eyes, a video series by Chip Ingram. Great study for everyone to be a part of that one. I have two small groups, but I'm going to introduce one of them because the other one is, is pretty full. Uh, the other one is open and, and ready to receive you starting September 24th on Friday nights at 6 p.m. A young adult smaller group will be meeting in the youth, um, youth room, really specifically young family small group uh, at the church to study a book of the Bible. We'll meet every other week starting on the 24th. Since many of those attending have young children, we'll also have... Um, uh, some, some teaching, some parenting strategies and techniques as well. Child Care is provided. Great group for you who have younger families and are ready to connect with God through his word, finding God to reveal himself through his word, and connect well with other people who have been given the Holy Spirit. You see, when you can learn from his word and we can learn from others, this small group will do both of those things well. My prayer for this group comes from Psalm 149, 6, which says, May the praise of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword in their hands. Come on September 24th at 6 p.m. in the youth room. Filet mignons are provided. Uh, well, no, I shouldn't, shouldn't lie in church. Uh, we, uh, we will have, I mean, yeah, I'm very much kidding. Uh, we'll have child care there as well. I got saved in uh, 1974. I was 27 years old in a parking lot at the University of Minnesota. And I ran out right away and bought a Bible. And I was looking at the Bible. I read it like in two weeks. And I thought, man, my life is going to be a piece of cake now. <laughs> I, thought, I was sure, you know, I was, I was, you know, I'd never be sick again. I would never be broke again. <laughs> I would, you know, no conflict, all the stuff that, that Nate was talking about today. I thought, man, I'm free of that finally. I haven't found that to be the case. Uh, that's a long time ago, and my expectations of what God was gonna do in my life are different from what God actually did in my life. The Israelites were 400 years in Egypt. They were under bondage, they were slaves, and they were miserable. And Moses came along and he said, listen, God's got a place for us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Come, come on, let's leave. And they did. So they left with this expectation of a land flowing with milk and honey. And it's not what they found. They were 40 years in the wilderness. In, in that 40 years, 
16 times it's recorded in, in uh, the, the Pentateuch, or Exodus, Leviticus, and, and Numbers, that they complained to the Lord. They said, this isn't what we signed up for. I don't understand what's happening. I don't understand the, I don't understand the politics of this. I don't understand why somebody's sick. I don't understand why you're the boss. I don't understand why we have to eat manna every day. I'm sick of manna. And they had complaints against God and against Moses. 16 times. Most of us, if we think of the Pentateuch, we think of the book of Genesis. We, we think of the flood. You know, we think of creation. Very little space is given to those. A lot of space is given to these, this trek through the wilderness. And it's talked about in the New Testament. That's like our lives. We head out in this life, or the disciples, when we see what they entered in the book of Acts, you know, the day, the day that Jesus ascended into heaven, they said, are you gonna establish the kingdom now? Is, you know, is this the second coming right now? And it wasn't. He said, you're gonna be witnesses for a while. So we, we have these examples of what the Israelites complained about and what they learned, and they were written for us so that we know how to face life when God doesn't seem to meet our expectations. We're going to be talking about this. We've got a small group going. You can sign up for it if you'd like downstairs. It's, it's for all you guys that are not working <laughs> because it's Mondays. The first meeting is tomorrow, 1 o'clock in the afternoon in the cafeteria downstairs here. We, it's our very first meeting. There's going to be 16 total because we meet the second and fourth Mondays of every single month. So between now and uh, between tomorrow and, and middle of May, there's gonna be 16 meetings. We're gonna talk about these 16 objections or complaints that the Israelites had against God and look at the complaints and our lives and how they reflect what God is doing with us. So you're welcome to come down and join. If you, if you sign up there and you sign your, you know, put your email in there, you'll be on, in line for getting our updates and our, our things like that. There's handouts all the time. So you can go down, and there's a little brief discussion of it down there. But I invite you all, anybody that can do it, come 1 o'clock tomorrow and kick off. And at the end of those 16 sessions, you'll be a different person than you are today. You'll be a different person than you are. You'll be more like Jesus. So I welcome you to come to our small group. Good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me yet, um, my name is Abby Volk. I'm the new children's director here. Um, this year, I'm really, really excited. We're going to step into some really cool opportunities um, to disciple kids and to just help them to gain a biblical literacy that they might not otherwise have. Um, but alongside that, it's really one of my greatest passions is that it wouldn't just be children's ministry for children but rather a family ministry where parents can be equipped for, to teach their kids, where parents can learn how to come alongside their children and help to grow that faith. And not just parents, but the whole family, siblings, aunts, uncles, grandparents, to really have that interconnectedness of families um, to bring up faith development in the children. Um, however, on this side of it, that does mean that we have Sunday morning and Wednesday morning, or Wednesday evening programs. Um, so we're doing Awana, Awana again this, some, um, this school year. Oh my goodness. Uh, so we're doing Awana again this school year. Um, I still need three to four volunteers on Wednesday evenings to make Awana operational um, at a minimum. And then Sunday mornings, I still need three to four volunteers um, to help out teachers in their classrooms and um, be able to really give the students the attention and the um, connectedness that to be able to teach them well. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, that would be an amazing opportunity to help you um, get the chance to pour into kids' lives that you may not otherwise get to do. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and warning one another. Uh, we have a men's Bible study group on Saturday mornings, and uh, it's at 8 o'clock every Saturday morning. Uh, we meet down in the conference room just off the Koinonia Cafe, and we're studying right now through the prophecy of Isaiah, um, slowly. So it'll take a long time to get through it. 
Uh, but uh, we have men who have been coming there for years, and um, some of them come with their sons and some with their grandsons, and we encourage the men to come 8 o'clock uh, every Saturday morning uh, down in the Koinonia, just off there in the conference room. We'll have coffee and usually donuts, uh, something like that for you. And uh, if you want to study uh, Isaiah with us, we're, I think, in chapter 29 or 30. Uh, I, I'm all through Isaiah, but uh, I think our next study together is uh, Isaiah 29 or 30. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Palmer, and I would like to invite the women to come to a couple of different options for women's Bible study this fall. One of the options we have is to meet in person here in the, we start out in the cafe. It starts this Tuesday, the 14th. We meet at 915. We do have child care available. So if you need child care, if you have grandkids you want to bring, if you have friends you want to invite, please let them know. This is a great study for inviting people to join us if they are new to Christianity, if they're new to reading the Bible. We're studying a book called Open Your Bible. We're not studying the book. We're studying our Bible, but we're being guided through it with a book called Open Your Bible. And it talks about how the Bible is for us here and now. And it is meant to give us a greater appreciation, a deeper understanding, and a stronger desire to know God's word. And it's going to also give us practical ways to read it, study it, and apply it with confidence. There will also be an option to join in via live stream to what we're doing in person if you're not able to attend in person. And there's also one other study option this fall. It is a Zoom only group, so they will not meet in person. It starts on September 21st, and it is every other Tuesday from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. And then the off weeks, they will meet as you're available for fellowship and playing games online together and they will be studying the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments. Finally, we also have a fitness class that is free on Tuesdays at 8.15. It also starts this week, the 14th, and we have limited child care available for that as well. Bruce, did you want to say anything about your small group? No. <laughs> that best one is what he said. That the world may know, 6 p.m., uh, first and third Sundays in the conference room, uh, be a part of that. The, uh, we're going to do some uh, ultimate Frisbee after Awana on Wednesdays, not a Bible study at all. I think, I think they even like to call it uh, doily ultimate or something like that because they use, literally, they use this doily rather than a Frisbee. It works. So a lot of fun. Kids have a good time after Awana, be a part of that volleyball on Friday nights as well. Those are starting at the end of September, beginning of October. Um, is there anything other on the others that I don't? I think we got just about all the others, Pastor Nate, except for yours. Many of these people will be downstairs. You guys can actually head down there now if you want or head back to wherever. Pastor Maurice will be in here teaching a Sunday school class. So if you want to learn about the life of and faith of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. You can be in here after uh, we're done here in a couple minutes, and Pastor Maurice will lead that. There's another Sunday school class that I'll be teaching about communication and conflict resolution downstairs. But I want to let you know about my small group. I would uh, go toe-to-toe with Bruce, arguing that mine's the best small group. Um, it, it, when you ask a question like, well, what is your small group study? Uh, study's like the, the bottom of our list. It's not off of our list. We generally do sermon a recap, exp, like uh, um, application in our own lives, but it is definitely third on our list in that we spend far more time connecting with each other and far more time praying than we spend studying. And that is something that is available to anyone. We, if you come to our group and you have kids, we likely have something for your kids to do with other kids that are there. If you don't have kids and want to come to our group, that's awesome as well. We don't care what age or faith background you do or don't have. We would love to have you alongside of us. We meet in a home in Ramsey uh, on Sunday evenings at six o'clock. And we love doing that together. There's usually a uh, dessert kind of food and uh, fun together. And we're a group of people who um, I would say some of us are people who recognize that we want to do life well with other people, but our natural wirings don't find that happening very often if we're not intentional about it. And so we choose to be a part of a small group because it puts on our calendar and we see people very consistently. We get to know each other very well. We get to pray with each other very well and care for each other uh, very well. We'd love to invite you into that. We have had a few members that 
uh, have opened up space because they've gone on to start their own Bible studies or they've gone out of town on uh, missions work or they have uh, gone and been part of a new church plant. So we see people launched into what God is doing in their lives in really cool and fun ways and are excited to see how God does that in all of our lives. So uh, I, I lead that group, hosted at another home in Ramsey on Sunday nights at 6 o'clock. Uh, we'll start either September 26th whatever that last one is, 26th uh, or uh, October 3rd, one of those two weeks. But you can sign up on the table down in the cafe for that. Um, I won't be there because I'll be teaching a Sunday school class, but you can still sign up there um, without me standing there. Um, and I want to let you know if you're engaging with us digitally and want to sign up for any of these groups, like type a comment, send a message to any of the staff, particularly uh, Pastor Nathan helps organize a number of our small group ministries. And so reach out to him, Hunter N at NowThenAlliance.org and just let him know there's one you're interested in and he can pass that along or that, those leaders info along to you as well. Our hope really is that we would connect with each other so that we could provide friendship, hope and support. We all need that. God wants us all to have that. We think the best place to find that is with other people who also want to live lives of faith in Christ. So I'd encourage you to sign up for those. All of those signups are available down in the cafe. So you can head there, grab coffee and a treat and hang out with people or grab coffee and a treat. Come back here for Pastor Maurice's study in the book of Genesis or to room 102 downstairs for a study on communication and conflict resolution. I hope as you go, you go with grace and peace ready to connect with others. Go in God's grace, you are dismissed.